So the work in my laboratory is focused on the molecular pathogenesis of muscular dystrophy uh, and trying to understand what is going wrong in the various muscular dystrophies and hoping by understanding the, the defect completely we'll be able to come up with rational uh, therapies for these diseases. So muscular dystrophy is a term that covers a large group of genetic diseases. Um, you'll see in a moment there's probably over 40 or 50 different types of muscular dystrophy. Uh, the primary defect is in the skeletal muscle cell, so not in the motor neuron, but in the skeletal muscle cell themselves. But it also affects other uh, systems, including the CNS. And the, you end up having progressive muscle weakness and wasting uh, in the muscular dystrophies. An example of a, a biopsy from a, a patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is illustrated here. So instead of having uh, pure muscle cells, you end up having muscle cell death, muscle cell necrosis, as illustrated here. Uh, eventually, you start to lose muscle cells, and you end up having uh, fat infiltration and fibrosis. And at this stage is when the patients begin to become weak because they're losing uh, functional uh, muscle. Now, for a number of years, this type of tissue was studied. It wasn't to the work of Lou Conkel and Ron Wharton and Kay Davies that the gene uh, for muscular dystrophy was discovered, and that was dystrophin. It's on the X chromosome. This is an X-linked disease. And it occurs in around 1 in 3,000 to 1 in 4,000 uh, young boys that are uh, in, the U in the U.S. So on the top of this panel here, you see the uh, protein product of the DMD gene, dystrophin. Since then, there's a large number, and this slide keeps getting outdated, of different genes that have been discovered involving uh, that cause uh, muscular dystrophy. Now, one interesting aspect, a large number of those genes, probably close to 70 or 80 percent, uh, produce proteins that reside at this interface. So this is a muscle cell. These, this is the contractile apparatus that causes muscle contraction, but this is the plasma membrane that surrounds each muscle cell. And this is a, a cell that contracts and moves, and this plasma membrane can be fragile. And we'll see this is a site of, of damage uh, that leads to the muscular dystrophies. The plasma membrane interacts with basement membrane material that tightly associates with the plasma membrane and cytoskeletal proteins that are under here. It ends up most of those genes uh, that cause muscular dystrophy produce proteins that end up here in the cytoskeleton, in the membrane, or the basement membrane. And uh, the newer genes that are, we'll talk about today are actually enzymes that process proteins that go to this site. So this is a particular hot spot. There are other myopathies that are caused by mutations in the contractile proteins, but a particular hot spot for the progressive muscular dystrophies uh, is the sarcolemma basement membrane interface. Now, our lab began work on this system by characterizing a, a complex that ex resides at that interface. It's called the dystrophin glycoprotein complex. So this is a, a large complex, over a million molecular weight, made up of many proteins. Uh, we found it by looking for the proteins that dystrophin was binding to. Uh, dystrophin interacts with the cytoskeleton, as I mentioned, here inside the cell through the complex of membrane proteins, in particular dystroglycan, uh, which is a transmembrane protein and an extracellular protein. And this extracellular part of alpha dystroglycan is a high affinity receptor for laminin, perlecan, and uh, uh, agrin, and other molecules that have LG domains uh, that reside in the basement membrane. So from this biochemical characterization, you can see that one function of this complex is to link the basement membrane that surrounds each muscle cell to the underlying cytoskeleton. And when you have defects in this complex, you disrupt that uh, linkage. Now, and when we first characterized that, we knew that this complex was involved in Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy because dystrophin is the gene for that, uh, this, those dystrophies, Duchenne and slash Becker muscular dystrophy. But then as we and other labs characterized the entire complex, we found that mutations in these proteins called the sarcoglycans, a subcomplex in the membrane, leads to limb girdle muscular dystrophy subtypes 2C to 2F. Uh, we have mutations in laminin 2, which is the muscle form of laminin, leads to congenital muscular dystrophies. Uh, I'll show you at the end, uh, absence of this NNOS signaling molecule leads to muscle fatigue. And probably more recently, there's a group of congenital slash limb girdle dystrophies, this is the growing group of diseases, that are really uh, caused by abnormalities in the glycosylation, the post-translational post -translational modification of alpha dystroglycan. And I'll mention in a moment that this glycosylation is essential for this interaction with laminin. So these dystrophies are disrupting uh, this interaction at that point. 
Now, the genes involved are endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi genes, and maybe that's why uh, I was invited for, for this uh, rare disease symposium that's, that's focused on the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, Golgi. Now, uh, they're referred to as secondary dystroglycanopathies because so far no gene mutation has been found directly in dystroglycan. Uh, the POMT1, POMT2 complex reside in the ER, and that actually puts mannose onto proteins, and the major protein is, is dystroglycan. Uh, and then the remaining proteins, Fucatin, FKRP, Lodge, Lodge2, and the other proteins are all found in the Golgi. And all of these enzymes process dystroglycan and allow it to bind laminin at the cell surface. Now, our first inroads into trying to identify causes for congenital muscular dystrophies came when we looked at biopsies from patients with different forms of congenital muscular dystrophy. These are very early onset muscular dystrophies, so that at birth the physician can tell the, the child has a dystrophy. Uh, in some cases they have CNS abnormalities and malformations. In other cases you can see abnormal white matter. They've been classified uh, sometimes just based on the symptoms like muscle eye brain disease, in other cases based on the gene products. And a number of these genes have been identified. Uh, there's probably six right now, and the genetics indicates there might be another six. So there's a, a large group of these enzymes that are involved in the, the processing of uh, alpha dystroglycan. So our laboratory works with uh, muscle biopsies from patients. Uh, we receive these biopsies, and in most cases they can be diagnosed quite quickly, but probably around uh, 10 years ago we started receiving biopsies that were a little bit more difficult. When we stained with antibodies to beta dystroglycan, they looked quite normal. Uh, this is control skeletal muscles. You see each muscle cell staining with this protein antibody to beta dystroglycan. This is muscle from a patient with muscle eye brain disease, so it looks normal. And this is patient uh, from a Fukutin patient, uh, which is prevalent in Japan. Uh, these cells are a little bit smaller because it's from a very young child. If you stain with antibodies to the core protein of alpha dystroglycan, the staining also looks normal. But we had two antibodies that recognized the glycosylated form of alpha dystroglycan. And when we stained with those two antibodies, these two monoclonals, they looked like there was no staining. So this was the first suggestion that the protein was present, but it wasn't fully glycosylated. So to prove that, we took the muscle biopsies and did some membrane biochemistry, and we isolated these preparations. And you can see in this, beta dystroglycan is normal uh, in control versus Fukuyama. If you look at 2H6 staining, the one that recognizes the sugar residues is completely deficient. If you look at the core protein, the protein is present, but it's around 60 kilobalt and smaller. So there's an extensive glycosylation that's missing in these patients. And almost all the patients that I've you know, presented today uh, will have this shift in molecular weight and this decrease in uh, uh, 2H6 staining. Now, we knew this glycosylation was important for function. If you look at laminin binding, this is control laminin binding. It's very high affinity binding to alpha dystroglycan, and this is binding to a patient biopsy FCMD and this is the quantitation. So both for muscle eye brain and for all the other dystrophies, the absence of this glycosylation leads to the loss of high affinity laminin binding. While we were doing this, a mouse model was discovered with another one of these genes. This is a particular gene called Lodge. This shows the staining with that antibody 2H6. It's completely deficient. The same around 60 kilodalton shift in molecular weight, but the protein is present no 2H6 staining, and no high affinity laminin, and this is just in, in an overlay assay. And this assay actually works quite nicely because dystroglycan binds laminin through the glycan, not through protein, protein interactions. So in trying to understand this and trying to explain this to uh, the families that visit our laboratory, one of the postdocs, Toby Willow, came up with a nice model for the, the processing of dystroglycan. So that in control muscle, the, the POMT1 and POMT2 guys put on mannose, and then you go through the Golgi and the rest of the enzymes, all these little workers, are, are decorating the dystroglycan molecule with sugars. The molecule is almost totally covered with sugars. There's probably only sm three small peptide regions that are free from sugar. So this is an extensively glycosylated molecule, as you can see from that shift in, in molecular weight. And the end product is a product that will be reside in the plasma membrane, but bind laminin in the extracellular matrix. So it forms this link uh, uh, between the plasma membrane and the basement membrane that surrounds the muscle cell. And in patients with defects, like in this case, the uh, POM uh, GNT uh, little worker is not functioning correctly, this process doesn't occur, and you don't have the extensive glycosylation, and you don't have this link into the extracellular matrix. 
So this work was going very well, and at the time, NIH called for uh, new centers to study muscular dystrophy, and uh, myself, uh, Steve Moore, who's a neuropathologist, and Kathy Matthews, who's a pediatric neurologist, uh, teamed together to form a Wellstone Center. Uh, this center has a goal of trying to treat the glycosylation deficient uh, muscular dystrophies, and this center has been going very well. The center has three major uh, groups a project in my laboratory towards translational research, trying to develop unique uh, approaches to therapies. Uh, a clinical project by Kathy Matthews to study the patient with patients with dystroglycanopathies, and at the same time also to, to test some initial therapies. Uh, we have a, a monthly uh, meeting where we discuss the biopsies from new patients and the current patients uh, in, that have been seen in the clinic. And this is attended by both my laboratory, which contains basic sciences, and the clinical people. And this whole center uh, operates quite well. Uh, we have uh, some cores. We have t muscle tissue repositories, so we get lots of muscle biopsies in and cell repositories. And we have an education component. So this is an example. Once the center was established, a, a young girl actually from LA, uh, her mom and her came out to visit us. She had been diagnosed with a congenital slash limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, and through analysis, I'll show you her biopsy in a moment, it looked like a dystroglycanopathy. And through, through sequencing, we found there was a mutation in POMT1. So this actually started to be a little bit of a surprise, because initially we thought most of these genes only caused the severe form of muscular dystrophy. But as you'll see uh, with the rest of the talk, we really these genes can cause severe to, to very mild forms of muscular dystrophy. So this is a biopsy from that little girl. The components of that complex, dystrophins, sarcoglycans, all look normal. So if this was a Duchenne patient, this would be completely negative. Uh, dystroglycan is present, mericin is present. But you can see with 2H6, there is some staining, so it's not completely null. And that's probably why she has the mild phenotype. With 6A41, it doesn't appear to be any staining, so there's probably a slight difference there. <laughs> We then went on and we started receiving more patients, and this is a unique example of a Fukutin patient. So Fukutin is a gene that was originally described in Japan, causes, causing Fukuyama congenital muscular dystrophy. Uh, in this case, it was a retrotransposon into that gene, so the RNA level is knocked down around to 1% uh, of its normal levels. And it was originally assumed that only Fukutin cases would be found in Japan. And to our surprise, we're, we're now collecting many Fukutin mutations, not the retrotransposon, but this missense or stop mutations in that gene. And this is a little boy from Texas. Um, the deficiency in staining here, you can see the biopsy, that same shift in molecular weight, absence of laminin binding, and pretty severe pathology. Now, there's also uh, another gene, FKRP, that can lead to a, a milder form of muscular dystrophy. Um, and in this case, uh, there's a, a mutation that's pretty prominent in Norway. It's around a carry rate of one in 100. It's an isoleucine to leucine mutation, which is quite surprising that that causes disease. But you can see here with the staining, uh, the, with the glycoepitopes, that there's a deficiency in staining. Here with Western blotting, this shows different LGMD patients with several different mutations. The core protein is there, beta dystroglycan is there, but there's no 2H6 staining, no evidence for full glycosylation. And even more recently, uh, we uh, analyzed a patient who had a cardiomyopathy. So this young boy presented with cardiomyopathy at around, I think, uh, six months of age, and actually had a transplant at eight months, and we received the explanted heart. And if you look at his heart, you can see the absence of 2H6 or 6A41 staining. So typical glycosylation deficient muscular dystrophy, but now showing first in the heart. And it wasn't until nine years of age that he started to see mu muscle symptoms. So for some reason, this boy presented first with the cardiomyopathy. And at nine years of age, you can see they have a deficiency uh, in staining in skeletal muscle. And in most cases, the cardiomyopathy in muscular dystrophy patients is later on. Uh, usually, it appears you know, late teens or early 20s. Now, as mentioned in the beginning, HUD mentioned that the, uh, or uh, Steve mentioned about being uh, 
this being a rare disease day and that most people think that in most of these patients there's like 10 in the world. And, but once you start to study them, you begin to see that there are a lot more. And this is an example, and this is from around two years ago, of the FKRP cases, this page and this page, that we've seen at Iowa. So there really are a lot more patients out there. And I really agree with Steve's comment that we really need good studies to, to really understand the prevalence of these diseases. This is even Fukutin, the eight cases uh, that we've seen. So we now know for these glycosylation deficient muscular dystrophies, these dystroglycanopathies, that there are very mild cases, and any of the genes that we've found so far can lead to these mild limb girdle cases, uh, usually missense mutations. Uh, they usually have high, very high CK, but normal CNS function. And then there's the very severe end, the Walker-Warburg syndrome, uh, and all the genes have been found for this except for POMGNT1. There's been no patients found with a POMGNT1 mutation that have a WWS a phenotype, and they have a very severe phenotype in both muscle, brain, and eye. It's muscle, brain, and eye disease, which is milder. There's CMD with no brain involvement where they have muscular dystrophy, but the CNS is normal. And the spectrum is that some patients have migration defects and other patients have migration defects and uh, mental retardation. So there's also a spectrum in the, the CNS abnormalities. So overall, the, the pathogenic mechanism for this group of muscular dystrophies is that abnormal glycosylation of alpha dystroglycan disrupts the ligand interactions uh, between dystroglycan and laminin. In the CNS, dystroglycan can bind norexin, another G-domain containing protein, so there's probably evidence for its interaction, say, at synapses. In addition, uh, this disruption of this interaction uh, really is the, the basic uh, cause for the, the muscular dystrophies. The therapeutic approaches, uh, first obviously uh, gene therapy to put these enzymes back, has all the promise and problems of, of gene therapy. But since this is the first group of enzymes causing the, a muscular dystrophy, it's really quite exciting that we could develop pharmacological approaches or glycotherapies has been, has been shown to, for the CDGs, and possibly those would be alternate approaches to, to gene therapy. And in particular, I'll show you some evidence for this protein large. So, Several years ago, uh, a postdoc in the laboratory took cells, uh, uh, muscle cells from patients, and actually tried to ah. express the various glycosyl transferases. And to her surprise, one of the enzymes actually seemed to rescue almost all the patients. And let's just look at this panel first. So these are myotubes in culture, and this is a, a control myotube that stains with dystroglycan quite nicely, and laminin will bind to the cell surface because it's binding to dystroglycan. In Fukuyama or Walker-Warburg cases, there's no dystroglycan staining with the, the, this antibody 2H6, and there's no laminin binding. But if you overexpress large, and this is, shows the cells that are expressing large with GFP, you can restore 2H6 staining and laminin binding. So this suggests that large could actually bypass some of the defects that we see in some of these muscular dystrophies. And we now know further that there's a subset. You need to have mannose on the molecule. If you're completely null for mannose, this large will not rescue. But if you have a little bit of mannose on dystroglycan, large seems to be able to compensate and put on the glycan responsible for laminin binding. So the work that's currently going on in the laboratory now uses patient cells, these myoblasts, to study dystroglycan glycosylation, to look at the mutations, and we're also using these cells to try to uh, do in vitro screening for drugs that would increase glycosylation. And another fact that's exciting for this aspect of the research is there are no patients that are null. So if you're null for these enzymes or dystroglycan, it's lethal both in the mouse and humans. And so all the patients tend to have around 10 to 15 percent activity, sometimes 20 percent activity. And so we think that you should be able to develop compounds that would stimulate that activity and hopefully uh, rescue the, the phenotype. Now I, I want to go off into a little bit of the pathogenesis of the disease, and this leads into another possible uh, protein therapy for these diseases. So if you look at this group of diseases, unlike Duchenne and limb girdle dystrophy, where this complex is disrupted, I failed to mention in Duchenne, when dystrophin's not present, it seems that you need dystrophin to traffic or to stabilize the complex. The whole complex is lost. But in this group of diseases, all we're losing is the glycan. This is this interaction at this point, and we wanted to know what is really the function of this link between the basement membrane and the plasma membrane. So Instead of taking muscle biopsies from patients, we now started to make mouse models, and we have mouse models that mimic a lot of these diseases. 
And this is, illustrates a wild type mouse. There's alpha 7 integrin null mice. There's the MYD mouse, which is missing this glycan. There's dystroglycan null mice, uh, which are only missing dystroglycan and skeletal muscle. And these all have symptoms and have muscle uh, pathology. Now, one thing that we found when we started studying these mice is that in wild type, and this shows alpha 7 integrin as a control, that you still have that very nice tight association of the basement membrane, that fuzzy material with the plasma membrane. But in cases where we disrupt dystroglycan itself or the glycosylation, we find that there's a separation in many regions of the muscle between the basement membrane and the plasma membrane. And this is supported by the fact that dystroglycan you know, binds high, with high affinity to these uh, basement membrane proteins. And in some cases, we lose the entire plasma membrane, like it's been ruptured, but we still have the basement membrane. So this started giving us some clues to the pathogenesis. We then wanted to develop an assay where we could damage the muscle instead of doing you know, ec, uh, contraction type and damage, but a damage with a laser, and then look at this possibly damaged muscle. So we used a two-photon laser to damage intact muscle in, in the toe of the mouse, used this FM143 dye to measure the sites where the damage is occurring and the uptake of dye. So that's illustrated here for two cases. So this is control muscle, and the laser is going to hit around here. And you see the damaging event, and the dye goes in. And actually, the muscle membrane can repair itself. Now, without the proper glycosylation or the link to the basement membrane, this is an MYD muscle. You can see for the same laser pulse, you get much more damage that occurs. So this is mimicking what you see uh, in the exercise studies. So this presents this hypothesis, and we have, we've done this with different types of mouse models, that in normal skeletal muscle, the basement membrane is very tightly attached to the plasma membrane. And that when you do get some damage that occurs and during, say, uh, contraction, say you're running downhill where you're trying to stretch your muscles at the same time contract them, you can have a membrane repair system. And that's something else we've studied that can actually repair the membrane. But in dystroglycan disrupted muscle, there's many regions where the membrane and, and the basement membrane are not firmly attached. There's probably still some integrin attachments, but most of this is due to dystroglycan. And when you have membrane damage, this membrane damage can expand. You can have rupture, as we've seen in one of those EM pictures, and muscle cell necrosis. So this is just the first step. Muscle is very plastic. You get a segmental necrosis, and the, you still have the basement membrane present. And within that, the satellite cell, which is the muscle stem cell, starts to divide and regenerate muscle. And this is why probably uh, with Duchenne boys, the first few years of life, you don't see any symptoms, really. They have high CK, but they're still able to run around. But eventually, it appears that you lose that capability of regeneration. Maybe the tissue gets too damaged, and that's when you start to lose muscle uh, strength. So to test this hypothesis, we uh, came up with a, this principle, which is really a physics principle, the principle of fracture mechanics, where dystroglycan really is the adhesive, okay, that allows the basement membrane, which has the highest strength, the membrane that has collagen and laminin in those proteins, uh, to protect the lipid bilayer, the sarcolemma, which is very fragile. And this principle can be illustrated with a, a physics little model that you might have seen in, in high school uh, physics, um, where you take a balloon, that's the plasma membrane of the muscle, blow it up, so it now has tension on it, put a piece of tape, when the tape is equivalent to the basement membrane, and now you can take a pin and put it right through the piece of tape, and the balloon doesn't blow up. And the reason is that the basement membrane is providing the strength to the underlying fragile balloon, but if you put it on the side, it does blow up. And so we think dystroglycan is really critical to maintain the integrity of the sarcolemma membrane, and that without this proper linkage, you lead to the disruption and rupture of the sarcolemma membranes. So if this were the case for the dystroglycanopathies, we should be able to put dystroglycan back, because it's synthesized as a transmembrane protein, but gets clipped into alpha and beta dystroglycan. So we should be able to take dystroglycan and put it in, since it's a totally extracellular protein. So we've now been successful at making dystroglycan, when we make it, it's slightly different than the normal form of dystroglycan. Here you can see its molecular weight goes from around 120 to over 200 kilodaltons. So cells in tissue somehow have the ability to control this. So skeletal muscle is around 150 kilodaltons. Brain is around 120. Cardiac could be around 180. The glycosylation is different in almost every tissue and even in different in some skeletal muscles. And the cells control it quite nicely. It's always a a broad band, but it's always you know, pr uh, pretty well defined in terms of molecular weight. When we make it, we're not able to control that yet, so it's pretty broad. 
But if we take this, it binds laminin, and we actually can add it to patient cells and get recovery, it'll bind back. And so we did an experiment where we injected this purified alpha dystroglycan that we made, and you can see that into this MYD mouse, which is the mouse that's deficient in glycosylation, and it gets into the right region, binds to the polybasement membrane and plasma membrane. If you don't have beta dystroglycan present, it, this doesn't occur. Now if we look at this damage assay, this is the MYD mice, Again, and this is MYD where we've injected the purified alpha dystroglycan. So it seems that dystroglycan gets in and actually is functional in terms of sealing up the, or bringing the basement membrane and the plasma membrane together. Now, the discouraging part of this is that it only lasts for around 10 days. Uh, it disappears uh, pretty quickly. And, and that's probably because it's really not the natural form of alpha dystroglycan. In other experiments where we use tamoxifen Cree to knock out dystroglycan, it takes almost two months. So usually these basement membrane receptors have a very long half-life. The second thing, we only can do IM injections. If we do any other type of injection, dystroglycan that's glycosylated never gets to the muscle. And there's probably too many other sites that it binds to uh, that have LG domains, laminin, uh, laminin 1, which is extensively around all tissues. And so it doesn't seem to be a direct therapy. But it does offer proof of principle that if you could get it to muscle, it looks quite interesting. So this suggests a key for the pathogenesis is that you can have different gene mutations but the end result is you lose this link between dystroglycan and the basement membrane, and that makes the muscle susceptible to these lengthening contractions and large membrane lesions that lead to the pathogenic pathway. Now, I'm going to end uh, with a story that shows how the interaction with patient groups actually can really help a, a basic science laboratory like myself. So uh, our lab, uh, in addition to doing the muscle biopsies, uh, also uh, hosts tours for the patients. And usually uh, any of the patients that are in Kathy Matthews' uh, clinic come over maybe once a week to see the laboratory. And they, the, our laboratory is quite big, so they, the patients that are, have limb girdle dystrophy that are able to walk usually try to walk around the whole laboratory. And one of the things we notice is they get fatigued when they're doing this uh, tour of our laboratory. In addition, a lot of the children always want to see the, the mouse models that we have, and so we would always have the mice out or take the treadmill out to show them the mouse models. So both of those things led to uh, this next study. So the first thing is that uh, as a group of PhDs, we realized that muscular dystrophy patients really only perform mild exercise. So if you go to most exercise laboratories that study exercise uh, in control mice, they take mice and they run them for two hours or swim them for six hours. And you know, muscular dystrophy patients don't run marathons. They just do very mild exercise and they still get fatigued. And uh, the patients and families, again, as I mentioned, were interested in seeing the mouse models. So we devised a very mild exercise protocol for these mice, unlike what was typically done in the field. So we exercised them only for 10 minutes we actually exercise them during their dark cycle. So instead of waking up the mouse in, in the middle of the day, so say, say like waking up and going on a treadmill, we exercise them, we switch the lights in the mouse rooms, and so we exercise during their dark cycle. And we don't do the strenuous exercise. And the results of that are shown here. So on this side, we see pre-exercise. This is three dystrophic mouse models in the laboratory, and this will be the case for almost all of them. And this is a wild-type mouse. And this is what we typically first showed the, you know, the kids and families with muscular dystrophy. And the response usually was, those mice don't look they, like they have muscular dystrophy. You know, it looks, you know, or it's very mild. Now, if we exercise them for that 10 minutes, this is the wild-type mouse, and these are the three dystrophic mice. You see they really do have a phenotype. Uh, this mouse will sit here for probably a half hour. So the mice, with very mild exercise, exhibit this fatigue or inactivity post-exercise. And so it really appears to be a, a phenotype that we could quantitate. We obtain a system that actually can do this with lasers. And so this is a dystrophic mouse, a wild-type mouse. And we can look at vertical activity, horizontal activity, many different me uh, measures. And here, the wild-type, after 10 minutes of this exercise, is completely normal same activity, but the MDX mouse, which is missing dystrophin, has a dramatic decrease in activity, suggesting that you could quantitate this uh, fatigue. And that's illustrated here. So two different wild types, C57 black 10 and the black 6, have very little change in activity post-exercise, where the MDX mice dramatically decrease. Uh, this is a sarcoglycan model, same thing, dramatic decrease in activity post-exercise. Uh, 
If we look at specific force, there are changes, but really it's not due to the force, this inactivity. There's, there's only a really, at this stage, at 10 weeks of age, not a large decrease in specific force. Now, as was mentioned earlier, and one assay that's used in, in our field and other fields is the six-minute walk assay. And for Duchenne boys, this is quite uh, useful. You can see here, control boys and DMD boys. The, the six-minute walk really can distinguish the two. And so we took the same activity assay and put it into the, the six-minute walk assay for the mice. So pre-exercise and post-exercise, this is the ambulation, the distance, with the black six model. But now if we look at the MDX, uh, pre-exercise is a, a big difference, just as you see in the, the case for Duchenne boys. But if you exercise them for 10 minutes, there's even a more dramatic difference in distance that they can move post-exercise. So this gave us a really nice measure to quantitate uh, this inactivity. Now, we went through various mouse models, and I'll get to the end of the story, but it ends up the molecule responsible uh, for this inactivity, the loss of this molecule, is NNOS. So that molecule that binds to the cytoplasmic side of the, the, the muscle DGC complex. And if we just take NNOS null mice, they have this inactivity. And if you look at NNOS null mice, they have normal muscle physiology, they have normal muscle histology, they're just missing NNOS. So this suggested that it was some type of signaling event, probably maintaining blood flow, that allowed the mice to have activity post-exercise. So if you exercise one muscle, you maintain blood flow to that exercising muscle, but you constrict blood flow to the other muscles. And so during exercise, there's a number of mechanisms that maintain blood flow to the exercising muscle. But post-exercise, in the recovery phase, really NNOS plays the major role in maintaining blood flow to that muscle, those muscles. So we then decided, well, if, if blood flow really was the problem, we could probably use some vasodilators to test this. And most vasodilators actually gave us more problems, didn't change anything, until finally we tested the PD-5A inhibitors. And they quite nicely affect this. This is MDX treated with the PD-5 inhibitors. They increase activity post-exercise. Same thing true here. This is for a sulfoglycan model. This is for the MDX. They don't work if you don't have NNOS. So you need to have some NO signaling. And the PD-5 inhibitors, as we know, enhance that NO signaling and allow for blood flow uh, post-exercise. And in the six-minute uh, walk assay, this is MDX. Uh, Pre-exercise, it almost comes up to the normal when treated with the PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, Post-exercise, there's a, still a dramatic increase in activity, uh, maintaining blood flow. So this was interesting for MDX and sulfoglycan models, and then we went back to the patients. And it ends up this loss of NNOS, which had been well characterized in Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy, is also seen in other dystrophies, including uh, the dystroglycanopathies. So it's really much more common and actually might be contributing to fatigue in a number of these cases of dystrophy, some of them such as one of the collagen ones, which there's no direct uh, genetic link to the DGC complex. So this suggests that NNOS is critical to maintaining blood flow post-exercise and that uh, patients with muscular dystrophy actually uh, somehow lose this NNOS and through the disruption of the GGC or through another non-genetic mechanism and leads to the loss of blood flow post-exercise, that fatigue that they show. Now, one aspect is you could treat these patients with these compounds, increase activity. But another possibility is that really nature is trying to slow down the boys with muscular dystrophy so they don't damage their muscles that much. So we're still not sure in the long term whether this would be a useful treatment. Uh, it seems like it should, that you increase blood flow and maintain better metabolism for muscle, but it still uh, needs to be tested. Now, one other aspect that I think we should always make when we study rare diseases is sometimes they give you clues to very common diseases. So while we were doing this, um, we were involved in a, a medical physiology class with someone who takes care of patients in the ICU, and we were telling them about our NNOS story, and they had patients in the ICU that become very weak, especially respiratory muscles. And so we started to looking at biopsies from patients with ICU-induced weakness, and those patients are also missing NNOS. Uh, we don't know yet if the RNA levels are normal. It's something we're just about to study. But it's quite interesting that their fatigue might also be due to the loss of NNOS, the decrease of blood flow to muscle. And so this is an example where studying these rare diseases could actually lead to clues to something that's very common. There's lots of patients with ICU-induced weakness, and it's very hard sometimes to remove patients from respirators because of this. And so this is a good example of another reason for studying rare diseases. 
So in summary, for this part of the talk, exercise-induced inactivity really is a distinct symptom in, that can be studied in the mouse models. Uh, there are non-dystrophic cases where you see this. It's really sarcolemma and NOS signaling that's required to maintain activity to, to relieve the fatigue. Um, we also find there's edema, and edema might be contributing to some of the pathology when you don't have proper blood flow. And if you have mislocalized NOS in these cases, then the PD-5 inhibitors could actually be used. So I'd like to thank uh, various group postdocs in the laboratory involved in this, and my colleague Steve Moore and Yvonne Kobayashi, who did that last study, and also to thank all the, the families that have been uh, supporting us and actually visiting the laboratory. And I'll end there and take questions. Yes, can I ask a question? Kevin, over here. Oh. Uh, have you looked at tetrahydrobiopterin biology in the muscle? No, we because haven't. Because it's very often when there's inflammatory situation, you end up with a lot of reactive oxygen species, is, which destroy the BH4. And most of the, the NOSs are dependent, the stability is dependent on having BH4 in their active site, their dimers. Okay. They come apart and become unstable. So, so we could have a non functional NOS too, in addition to. Or it could or be unstable and then becomes degraded. It's degraded. Oh, that's a good point. So I was suggesting looking at reduced or, you know, B tetrahydrobiopterin as one possible factor. And the reason is there's actually, right. it's around, it's actually could be used as a treatment. Right. No, because that, that could clearly explain some of the, you know, the non DGC related loss of NOS. Would be interesting to look at. Uh, NNOS binds to a particular region in the rod domain on dystrophin, so that's one of the binding sites you lose when you have Duchenne or Becker patients, so you actually lose the, the binding site. Yes? Have you looked to see whether selective NOS inhibitors, NNOS inhibitors, have the same effect as the loss of NNOS? Yes, yes. So we, we've tried, we've demonstrated that the NOS inhibitors or even safratoxin, which would cause vasoconstriction, have the, the same effect. Thank you.